Would you like to know what I found different from the United States while I was in Germany? Let's learn some vocabulary I would use to describe what I saw. Welcome to English Coach 3 T's. I'm Tanya. Recently, I returned from a fabulous vacation in Germany. I had the great opportunity to visit there for a little over a week and I saw just some wonderful things I want to share with you along with how you might talk about this. The great thing about the vocabulary I'm going to share with you today is that you could use this vocabulary to describe something you saw while you were traveling, but it's also vocabulary we use very commonly in all aspects of our life. Be sure to watch till the end of the video when I share my favorite part of the whole trip. So the first thing I recognized when I got to Germany as being different, at least from the part of the United States I live in, which is in the southwestern United States, is that everything was so lush. Lush is a word we often use to describe landscapes or plants that are very abundant, very green, very rich. And this was true of everywhere in Germany, in the city, in the countryside, everywhere we went, there was just this lush landscape and lush green everywhere. The great thing about this word is that recently, or I should say more recently, people have started using it in place of words like awesome or cool. So for example, if somebody says to you, this wonderful thing just happened to me, I want to tell you all about it, instead of saying, ah, that's awesome, you could say, wow, that is lush. Or you could just say lush, either way. This is something that I am trying to do myself, even as a native speaker, is to use different words when I'm talking with people because I find myself saying the word awesome over and over and over. Of course, being in Europe, we went to visit a lot of castles and fortresses. And this is very different than what you would be seeing if you were sightseeing in the United States. So for me, this was extremely interesting. Another way to say that something is extremely interesting is to say it's fascinating. And absolutely, as you can see in these pictures, the places we visited were definitely fascinating. What is something that's fascinating to you? I'm curious what fascinates you. Let me know in the comments below. Additionally, you can see that some of these places were magnificent. This is a word we can use again in place of something like awesome or incredible, but it more specifically means huge, very large and very beautiful. I was so impressed by all that there was to see. I took more pictures than I could possibly share with you here, but hopefully some of these will be interesting for you. I don't know about you, but whenever I travel, I love to go to museums, pretty much museums of any kind. And a couple of the museums I was able to visit while I was in Germany were an art museum and an apothecary museum. Now, art museums are very common here in the United States, and possibly there's an apothecary museum somewhere. If you know of one, you can let me know. But I've never heard of one, I've never seen one, so this was very, very interesting. And for me, it was very intriguing. Something is intriguing when it's so interesting you want to learn more. I enjoy learning in general, but especially I love to learn about the natural world. And the Apothecary Museum showed not only different apothecaries, but a lot of things you can learn about herbs and growing things. Do you enjoy visiting museums or what kinds of things are your favorite things to learn about when you travel? When I travel, I love to visit places that aren't necessarily tourist places places that are just an everyday place where you might see the locals. And I was very fortunate to be able to see this farmer's market. 
In addition to being able to see what the local people were buying, I could see some of the differences in the produce, which is just another word for fruits and vegetables. I visited this market with one of my students who actually lives in Germany. And so I was able to tell her all of the names of the different fruits and vegetables, or we would call this all of the produce. And I also was able to see uh, specifically a vegetable that I've never seen here in the United States. So again, if you've seen it, let me know. But this particular vegetable is what they call celery. And our celery looks very, very different from this particular one. So again, for me, when I'm traveling, I love to be learning and interacting with the local people as much as possible. I'm not one to buy a lot of souvenirs. Souvenirs are little gifts or little things you can buy to remind you of your trip or to take home to the people who didn't come with you. But after we visited the apothecary, they had a fabulous museum gift shop. And one of the souvenirs I purchased was this fan. It has lots of different types of plants on it. And because I love plants, this was something I couldn't resist. We say we can't resist something if it's something we really want to buy. And speaking of food, my host and hostess really spoiled me the whole time I was there. When we say someone is spoiled, it can mean a couple of different things. In this case, it means that I was pampered. This word might also be new for you. You may have seen the diaper brand that we have here in the United States called Pampers. And probably the reason they named this diaper Pampers is because when we pamper someone, we take extremely good care of them. You might say we go above and beyond, which is a phrase I've taught in some of these videos before. It's a phrase we use quite a lot, especially in learning environments or work environments or anywhere where you're talking about something somebody is doing a really great job with. Above and beyond meaning they're doing more than they were required to do. And even though there isn't exactly a requirement for how somebody would treat you when you're staying in their home, my host and hostess really spoiled me. They took such good care of me. They fed me such wonderful food. And obviously you can't taste it from these pictures, but you can see they went the extra mile. So this is just another way to say that someone went above and beyond. While on this topic, it reminds me of one of the greatest differences I noticed between the United States and Germany, or it might be Europe in general, which is that even though they eat a lot of bread and I ate a lot of bread while I was there, it wasn't difficult for me to digest like it is here in the United States. I tend to be sensitive to gluten, which is in the flour we use to make bread. So I avoid gluten, meaning I try not to eat a lot of it. But while I was in Germany, I ate bread all day long, along with some really delicious cakes that my hostess prepared for us and it never bothered me at all. So I found that I wasn't sensitive to the gluten. I've heard there are a lot of different reasons for this, so I'm not going to try to guess exactly why that was, but for me, it was something different and really fabulous because I love bread. If you enjoy learning English from real stories like this one, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss our next video. If you learned something new today, share this video with someone you know who'd also like to learn English. Another difference that I learned the hard way is that in Germany, they don't have doorknobs on their front door. Now, I didn't notice this on all the doors I saw. I wasn't even looking for it. 
but one day I decided to step out of the house onto the front porch to get a little fresh air. It was a beautiful day. And so I did that. I stepped out onto the front porch and when I turned around to go back in, there was no doorknob to, <laughs> to open the door. So I was stuck on the front porch. This is when my host explained to me that in Germany, it's really common to have no doorknob and instead you just have your key to let yourself back in. For me, this is very unusual because I often go in and out of my house a lot. Uh, since I live in such a small house, when the weather is nice, I like to kind of use the outdoors as an extension of my home or as an addition to my home. And while we're on the topic of homes, another difference I noticed was in the size of their refrigerator. Their full-size refrigerator was smaller than what you might typically see in American home here. Now, again, I live in a tiny home, so I have a very small refrigerator compared to most Americans. But I've heard that this is common in a lot of other countries too. How about in your country? Are your refrigerator is huge like ours or do you tend to have kind of a smaller refrigerator and you shop for fresh food more regularly and on the topic of refrigerators one of the things that i know is different in most of europe and was definitely different in germany is that in the united states we use a lot of ice in our beverages it is really common if you go to a restaurant or anywhere that they serve sodas like Coca-Cola and Dr. Pepper or tea or water or anything like that, it's going to come with ice in it. And often it's going to come with a lot of ice in it. Now, this has always been a discussion when I go places that people aren't used to that or it's not something that they do. So maybe someday we will have the great ice debate. We'll talk about which is better, ice or no ice. But until then, I'm curious what your preference is. It was something I missed while I was gone, but I wouldn't want you to think that I wasn't being taken care of because like I said, my host and hostess definitely spoiled me and offered me ice if I wanted ice because they knew this was something common in the United States, but I was practicing a saying we have here, which is, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Yes, we use this saying even if we're not in Italy. In fact, we use it all of the time here in the United States, uh, just to mean that when you are with other people or when you are where people do a certain thing, you can experience that same thing. And so I wanted to do that while I was in Germany. I wanted to experience what it's like to live in Germany as much as I could. A little hint for you about this idiom is that often we use the idiom without saying the whole thing. So instead of saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, we might just say, well, when in Rome, and we use that voice tone and often those gestures to go along with it. It's funny because a lot of what I noticed is that things were smaller. Another example is that the streets were more narrow. So narrow is when things are smaller in this direction. Wide is when they're bigger in this direction. Many of the streets were more narrow. A lot of this has to do with the history. There's a lot more history. We say a lot more history when we mean that it goes back further. Of course, that's not totally true. Our history goes back a long ways here in the United States, but it's quite different. These narrow streets are novel for me, meaning that they're new, they're interesting, they're enjoyable because it's not something I'm used to. And for me, it creates sort of a cozy feel, like a community, like we're all together, especially in the little villages that I was able to visit. Speaking of community, if you're interested in taking live classes with me on Zoom, be sure to check out the link below for more information about our women's speaking program. The information is at the link, but if you have more questions, you can email me my email is also below, or you can reach me on Instagram. Our Instagram has the same name as our YouTube channel.
One of the things I found very interesting is that they have these pieces of property that directly translate to the word allotments. An allotment is something you're given a part of. You are allotted this much of something. But these were like pieces of property, like I said, small. They look like what we would call a backyard. Behind most houses in the United States, especially single family homes, you will have a backyard. It might be small, it might be big. Either way, you have a little piece of property, a little piece of land where you can plant whatever you want. In Germany, because the houses are very close together and oftentimes it's multifamily housing, you can rent what they call an allotment. And it's a piece of property where, again, you can plant whatever you want. You can have a garden. And interestingly, many of them had a small building on them. I did learn that you cannot stay there. For instance, you could not put your tiny house there. And occasionally when we were out taking walks or driving, I saw families spending time in their allotment where the children were playing outdoors or maybe playing on play equipment or sitting inside the little building. It was very interesting for me. Now I have seen something like this in a neighborhood I saw in Arizona. I think with the internet, our world is getting smaller and smaller. This is something we say, which is obviously not literally getting smaller and smaller. Maybe you have a similar idiom, but with the internet, as we start to see and experience what other people are doing in other countries, we begin to adopt it or we begin to do that in our country as well. So I've only seen it once in this one neighborhood, but I think it is a really great idea. I think that it is probably more successful there, partly due to cultural reasons. In the United States, people tend to really value their individualism and privacy. Of course, this isn't true across the board, across the board meaning everyone, everywhere, but generally speaking, when people in the United States go home, they kind of want to be inside their house or in their backyard where there's a fence and you can't see them. This is different across different parts of the United States as well, um, but I find it really interesting that this has been something successful in Germany, and I'm curious what kinds of things do you know about in your country, whether it's cultural or physical differences that are different from the United States? One of the things I love about our community here is that we can learn from each other without ever leaving our homes. I have said over and over since I got home that even though this trip was incredible as far as seeing tourist attractions, learning new things, trying new food, and doing all the things we typically do when we travel. The best part was the people. I was able to meet three of my students and one of my colleagues while I was in Germany and see people I've known for two or more years online. But to see them in 3D and to spend time with them and their friends and their families was priceless. Priceless is something we use to describe something that is so fabulous. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you couldn't buy it. And I feel like I was extremely fortunate to not only meet these people I've known on Zoom, but to meet the people that are in their lives, to have really awesome conversations, to learn more about them and their thoughts and their ideas. And it just reminded me how fortunate we are that we can do so much of that now through the internet. If you made it to this point in the video, you've already done such a great job of practicing your English. If you want to take it one step further, I have two ideas for you. You could go back and listen again, paying special attention to any words or phrases that were new for you and practice saying them out loud. Or if you'd like to hear another real story similar to this one, 
take a look at this playlist where you'll find different stories about different topics. I'll see you there. Bye. Able to see what the... <laughs>